Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Right Here in Mass. Today's guest is Rhea McKenzie, an empowerment specialist, photographer, body image activist, and a guide for those journeying towards radical self-love and acceptance. Her mission is to hold space for women to be their authentic selves through a transformational and embodied photo experience. Rhea, thank you for joining us. Please share what you do and how you got started with your business. Thanks for having me, Ashley. Um, I got started with my business um, as a photographer that basically photographed anything that came my way. Um, so this was about 12 years ago. I was a super people pleaser. So I just said yes to everything and anything um, just to get myself going with my business. And over the years, I became a wedding photographer and only did boudoir for my past family clients who were moms or brides, um, but it really just struck a chord with me. And I realized how much these photos boosted women's confidence and helped them see themselves in a different light. So um, I knew that I wanted to niche down one day. I just didn't know how. So mm -hmm. with some helpful coaching and self-discovery, um, I niched down and I'm a full-time boudoir photographer with a studio, which is amazing, so. Awesome. And I know that a big struggle that businesses can face when they're looking to kind of phase out of one offering and really focus on another can be scary, um, especially if they're looking to get rid of the offerings or services that are tending to bring in more of the clients or customers than what they're looking to do. So what was that process like? Did you worry about not getting any clients once you changed to only boudoir or what was kind of like your mindset once you made that shift? Well, there was a lot that always goes through my mind <laughs> when doing anything um, in business. So I think the biggest shift was, yeah, I think there was always this scarcity of like, oh my gosh, can I even be a successful photographer outside of the wedding industry? Um, because the wedding industry is so big and all I was seeing around me at the time were wedding industry people that were successful. So I didn't have like an example in front of my face or personally that was a human being that niched down to that really excelled in boudoir. So I think that once I found coaching and the groups online, like through Facebook groups um, and through networking, I realized that it was completely possible and that and I really had to dig deep into like my own self-worth like how much time and energy am I going to be spending with my client versus like what I was spending with my wedding client so when I realized that like I'm still pouring that type of energy into my client than I am for like a full day at a wedding then I knew that like this is very valuable what I do and the takeaway that my clients were getting from boudoir were like lasting for so long, like for the rest of their lives, they never regretted it. And they hold themselves up higher with so much confidence. So to see how transformational it was, I knew that it had value. Um, so once I believed in myself and I knew that the value in this was, is going to last a lifetime, I had a ton of confidence just to move forward with it. Mm. And I know that you have a studio in Walpole. So what was that process like of coming to the realization that you would want or need a studio and then actually finding the one that could fit the needs that you have and really um, be able to serve the purpose that you're looking for? So when I was only doing boudoir once in a while, I was either renting spaces from friends with studios. Um, I was renting hotels. I was renting Airbnbs. So I just did it like all in one weekend. Um, so that was super exciting, but at least like I had these clients that were like waiting for me to run these boudoir events um, or I would call them like pop-up events um, or they were like mini sessions before. It was super exhausting for me to be doing that because again, like I'm pouring my energy into them for like an hour or two and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, so for my clients, they weren't able to like reach that transformation for that short period of time I was noticing than when I was having like this one client come to me that wanted a private boudoir that, um, outside of like the events that I was running or mini sessions that I 
was running. So when I started doing them individually, that's when I really saw that there is a huge transformation from, you know, nurturing my client for from the beginning of when they're getting their hair and makeup done throughout their own private shoot that felt really unrushed and that was more in tune with them or not like switching outfits really quick. Cause this is a very vulnerable, vulnerable thing for women to do. Right. Um, so it was a lot deeper and emotional for them. Um, they were having more fun. They were able to like let loose when it was a private session. Um, so I started like changing my pricing from that because you can only, you know, if I'm renting an Airbnb, like I have to rent it for the entire day or like two days. So I had to make sure that I'm like covering all my expenses that way. So that's mm-hmm. when I started to like switch that up. But when I started to niche down, I was renting from um, my friend Kristen, who ends, who owns Kadima Rentals. And she had this huge loft, the tannery loft in Norwood. And she was allowing me to like rent it for the entire day, then like, you know, package deals where I could come in for a certain times a, um, a month, which was super helpful for me because at the time I didn't know where I wanted my studio to be. And I'm right. a super overthinker. So I was just like, <laughs> I don't know where I want it to be. Um, I did continue to look and look and look. And then I wanted, you know, to make sure that wherever I'm going to be like, that's probably where I'm going to stay for a while. And I want it to be, it to be centrally located because my clients were from everywhere. They're from anywhere from like Boston to Providence to Cape Cod. So I wanted something central. Um, And it just so happened that my friend, Kristen, who owns Kadima Rentals was looking for a new place. And um, during the pandemic, like right in the middle of it, which I was super happy that I didn't have a studio before that because I would have been an anxious mess like oh yeah (laughs) because everything was just you know everything was shut down and small businesses were yeah we had such anxiety as a small business like how are we going to do our jobs like our whole identity was completely stripped away because we weren't able to be face to face with anyone I wasn't able to service anyone so um yeah during the pandemic she had found a new place with a second floor and now we're sharing a space called the Tannery Collective. So um, myself and Molly and photography are, are upstairs on the second floor, which is private. And then the downstairs is a showroom for Kadima Rentals and also events with Adorn Boutique. So it's a whole like empowered women hub. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when we have boudoirs, they are um, they're private and no one else comes in, which is so nice. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to hone in on something that you mentioned, which is the central location of your studio of being in Walpole. Mm -hmm. So you can accommodate your clients that come from all parts of the state and even out of state. Uh, But one thing that I'm curious to know, and I know our listeners will be interested to hear this too, is how you've been able to really focus on marketing to um, people within a specific geographic region. So that way you're able to capture people who are within driving distance to your studio and want to be able to come in and have their own boudoir session. Yeah, so I, I'm actually a nomad. I have lived in Middleborough for, I guess, like the longest I've ever st- um, stuck to one place is after I had children. So I never wanted to like, just limit myself to one town or one region. Um, and because I've moved around a ton, um, like I used to live in, I originally came to Taunton when I was 12 and then I moved, my parents moved to Cape Cod like six years later. Um, could have been earlier than that. Yep. Actually five years later, they moved to Cape Cod. I moved to Boston and I lived all around the Boston area and then, um, moved to Newton, Waltham, Berkeley to then Middleborough. I had Florida in between there too. So I just had this network of people that I've met from all different places. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just kind of knew people from all different locations. Um, But again, like I'm making friends from the North Shore, South Shore, Cape Cod. So they're from all these different places. Um, And that's kind of how 
I've always been. I've never just like lived in one place and been like, I'm just going to market to these people. It was just whoever was my friend at the time. They were from all different geographic locations. They just came into my Facebook group and mm. um, I've been able to keep in touch with them through there. So that's basically like, I don't pay for advertising. It is still like just me. <laughs> 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 it's just me advertising for myself. Um, and friends of friends. So it just kind of trickled down from word of mouth. Yes, definitely. And I'm glad that you mentioned your Facebook group, because that was actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you about being a member of the group myself. I see how active it is and how you get a lot of great engagement in it with people commenting on the posts that you share and even sharing their own posts and really just focusing on building a community. So what was that process like of actually starting the group from nothing and being able to build it up to what it is now? Um, it was really exciting because I think with boudoir, because it is so vulnerable and these are women's bodies that they're not comfortable sharing with everyone because there is still judgment in the world. And again, like if you don't understand the purpose and the mission of boudoir, then you can take it out of context, just like anything right. else we see on social media. So this was really exciting to have a safe place for women to know that it's a private group, that everyone understands the mission and we can, they can freely share their images if they'd like, and they're not going to get like backlash or like a misunderstood aunt or uncle or anyone super critical of them presenting and expressing themselves in this mm -hmm. like way that they're not used to seeing um, with less clothing, with, you know, they're pretty much badasses just like <laughs> on the internet. Um, and their photos are super empowering, but like, you don't want, you might not want grandpa or grandma to see that on Facebook, or I don't know, if you have, if you're a professional, some people have professions that that's not acceptable. Mm. anyone in the school system or like anyone that works in the government they would not you they would not want to like show their boudoir images on the internet right now right because unfortunately like the world is not all accepting of those types mm. of images um you do have to understand the why behind it and a lot of times like it is a pain in the butt to explain your why exactly <laughs> <laughs> right so it was super exciting to just like gather all these women to just like feel safe with sharing their images and really like rallying each other up. Um, so it's full of compliments and it's always a positive place, which is awesome. Yes. And it's super inspiring to see all the camaraderie and all of that fun stuff that goes into it. And what would you say was kind of like your biggest um, tip or method for being able to grow it beyond just adding your clients into it. So was there something that helped to get outsiders into the group and then therefore expose them to the beautiful work that you do and perhaps converted them into clients? Or was it just almost like a natural growth in itself? So it was naturally growing at first. It was, um, you know, it's me constantly showing what I do um, and showing pictures and I think the algorithm sometimes is just like the momentum starts building because if they've never seen this before or they've like always wanted to do it, they're like looking for more. So they're always mm. commenting like, oh, I like this idea. And it's very creative too. Like when you're doing a shoot for yourself, you're really honing into your own self-expression that maybe you're not expressing on a daily basis. So when women come in, they're like kind of going all out. They're like, I've always wanted to wear this dress. I have no place to wear it, but it's totally me let's throw it on. Um, or I feel like I'm a warrior and I want to express that. So um, they are taking pictures that they normally wouldn't take or like, you know, post all over the internet, but it's for them. But yeah. I think it's really empowering that they are like willing to share it to like help other women realize that they can do this too and feel this good. So um, with the growth of the Facebook group, it really just happened with just clients and then the client's friends. So they're like inviting all their friends and then eventually those friends invite their friends. So that's how it organically grew. But then I would do like fun stuff like um, giveaways, which supported some small businesses. So once in a while, I would like have a friend that owns a small business and we, I would purchase like a gift card to 
their business and we would give it away by the number of people that you invite and are accepted into the group. So that was like yeah. a huge growth point too. But with that, it's like, they have to follow the rules of, you know, you must be a 18 year old right. <laughs> woman and up. Like, please do not invite your husband into this group or right. your grandpa, uncle or brother. So sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Yeah. So it's a ladies club, but it is a safe place. So it's nice. So that really grew it too. And one of the things that I've noticed in your Facebook group, as you're sharing your work is that you partner with some vendors to be able to provide an ultimate experience to your clients by working with hairstylists and makeup artists to really bring everything together and make it a truly one of a kind experience for your clients. Um, But I know that being able to find the right vendors takes a lot of trust because you're putting yourself on the line and making sure that you're bringing in someone who's dependable and will treat your clients with the same respect and love and support as you do. Um, and as someone as like myself who has been burned by referrals before, it can be kind of like murky waters and it makes you a little bit anxious. So for people who are looking to expand the referral network and be able to partner with other businesses or individuals, did you find that there was a certain process that worked for you with being able to ultimately vet these people? Or how did you know that they were the right fit for what you were looking to do? This is so fun to answer because I have always worked with one of my closest friends, Sarah Rodriguez, who owns Making You Glow, and she is going to also open a spa soon. So super exciting. But we met just through um, like one of our best friends. We had like mutual best friends for years. So I've known her, um, my goodness, for like 14 years. So we kind of started new in the wedding industry together and then became really close friends. And we were always working together. Like before, before like Instagram was even a big thing and we were all just kind of on Facebook and before like, um, before anyone was really like networking in the industry, like we only knew each other and like maybe one or two people around us, but that was it. Like no one was, no one had like community gatherings yet. Like there was none Mm -hmm. of that yet. So we just had this trust with each other from the get-go and we're lucky enough that we um, were able to grow together professionally. Um, So I've always trusted her. So, and the great part is that we were, well, I was able to watch her self-develop and grow and she's able to watch me self-develop and grow. And we started Boudoir together. She was actually like my test Boudoir client. (laughs) (laughs) so this was like in 2011 um she was like the test boudoir client I'm like I kind of want to try this boudoir thing and since she did hair and makeup she's like all right I'll do my own hair and makeup and I'll have my friend and I'm like I just need like models so she had her friend Brooke come in and we did like a test boudoir shoot at the salon that she was working at revolutions which still exists but we still like joke around about this day and we're like oh my gosh, remember our first boudoir ever in 2011 when we just like did whatever we wanted. (laughs) We like made the hair salon a studio. We're like emptying out blank walls and like we threw like a chase lounge in a corner. We're like, let's just try it. (laughs) (laughs) So we did that. And then um, that's when we first started running like the mini sessions and it was so exhausting. I think I did like eight people that day. I'm like, what is oh happening? <laughs> like, what is By the end of the day, we're just like, throw yourself on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was so fun. And then from there, like anytime um, I did these types of events, we were just like, um, like I always had Sarah with me. So she's still working with me as the in-house stylist. And it's awesome because she's been with me from the beginning. Um, And then I also have other stylists that I've met in the industry that I've worked with at weddings. Um, So we've built a relationship that way. And because I know how great they are with clients and how um, great they are at building confidence or like redirecting the conversation so that it's like an uplifting experience. Um, Right. Because of that, like I always, you know, trusted the stylist coming in. Yeah. So no, Noelle from Makeup to Die For, she works with me a lot too. And she's been in the industry for like, my goodness, like over 25 years. 
and she's just super empowering and um these are just the women that i know are going to like really help embrace and nurture the clients um and just keep them in that great energy from the moment they get there until they leave right which is so important because it's that experience that ends up getting referrals for all of you down the line and being able to send business and clients back and forth to one another yeah yeah it's awesome and so one of the things that I also want to ask you about, um, because we're both middle bar residents is what do you love most about the area specifically for your business, even though your studio is based in Walpole, what would you say is great about the local community here with being able to focus on the entrepreneurship side? Hold on. That's a little really big question. <laughs> um, so what were you asking me? You're asking me why, what? what's good about being in Middleborough? Correct. Right? For entrepreneurship? Yep. Oh. <laughs> I think that it doesn't really matter where you live. Uh, like, I feel like Middleborough is my home for now, but I don't know. I'm not really attached to one place. Again, like this is the longest I've lived in one community. And I think it's so beautiful because I've never mm -hmm. really experienced community for an extended period of time like again my family right. and I always moved around um so it's it feels so great to like be a part of a smaller community um but also be interconnected with this whole region right so it's like it, I I feel like it's exciting to see what can happen in a small town um but again like we have to remember we're not limited to a geographic location. Right. I've had clients that have even moved away. Like I've met them when I lived in Taunton and they've moved away to a different state that have wanted to come and do a session when they visit or, um, you know, I don't think that it matters where you are when it comes to having a studio or having a small business anymore like if you need the high traffic then that would matter but if you're only looking to leave an impression um with a certain number of people a year then it really doesn't matter where you are like they will come to you if they know you they trust you and love what you do 100 percent and if there's anyone listening to this episode who is potentially thinking about starting their own boudoir photography business in Massachusetts, what's a piece of advice that you'd give them? I would say if you're in Massachusetts that, I mean, sky's the limit. You really don't have to feel so limited to where you're located or who's around you when you're a boudoir photographer or when you're in an entrepreneur for anything like you will get people that question what you do mm -hmm. um i feel like i'm interviewed all the time because my job is so different so that's why i feel like doing podcasts is like not a big deal for me like i will go to a party or i'll go somewhere new and they're like what do you do and i'm like oh i'm a boudoir photographer or i like i take pictures if i just say i'm a photographer they're like oh so you must take pictures of babies oh you do weddings <laughs> or, oh like there's so much i'm like no, I take pictures of women. They're like, doing what? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> there was one point where I was like, so tired of talking about myself. <laughs> I don't know if you ever get that. <laughs> do you ever feel that way? Like you're in a crowd and I don't know, they just don't understand what you do. So you feel like you're like, okay, here I go. Talking about Great. myself. Great. Or if someone asks me online, I'll actually direct them to a blog post that I've written or a podcast oh, episode I've recorded. And I'm like, here, read this or listen to that. Cause it can just get exhausting constantly explaining you things. You just <laughs> gave me a new mission, Ashley. I really do need to do a blog post explaining exactly what I do. I mean, I have my website, but then, yeah. you know, depending on the banner image, they're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like, what kind of website but, have I popped on? <laughs> I know, they're like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, there was one time where I was just so tired that I was like, I take pictures of, um, I take pictures of women. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, they're like, we're doing one. I'm like, well, no clothes on sometimes. So they're like, <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly really simple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, it gets really fun and interesting, but yeah, I think that with entrepreneurship, like you are 
your own worst enemy a lot. Like you can get in your own head. Um, The people that make negative comments, they can get in your head. So learning how to protect your energy and redirect your own thoughts to your purpose and your why is super, super important. So whatever you choose to do with business or in life, like as long as you know your why and you know your purpose, like you always have to start, you always have to redirect your thoughts and everything back to your why because all the little negative comments and trickles of self-doubt, like that can really bring you down for too long of a time. And Mm. um, you have to learn how to pick yourself back up and just keep moving. Absolutely. And actually that piece of advice that you just shared reminded me of advice I heard exactly this morning when I was on um, a Peloton run with Kirsten Ferguson, where one of her things that she always says for anyone who doesn't uh, take her classes is let it go like Elsa. And so what she said this morning was um, the thing that you're feeling bad about, do you think that the person who said it that made you feel bad is thinking about it as much as you are? No. So let it go. No, they're and not. You're absolutely that, right. I was like, oh my gosh, mind blown. <laughs> I know. It's so true. The people that make the comments, they, they have no idea that it sticks with us for that long. Right. Um, and they just go on about their day. And I'm like, oh, how dare I let them infiltrate my energy and my time for that long? <laughs> I know, I know. Living their life. um, And going off of that, one of the things that I've learned in business is that most of the time uh, when someone makes a negative comment or makes you feel bad, it's an issue within themselves and not necessarily with you. And so once I kind of understood that and shifted my mindset, now it makes it so much easier to receive negative comments, even though of course they're never welcome, but being able to just kind of internalize them yourself and process them, it makes it so much easier. Yes, you're absolutely 110% right about that. Um, I always keep that in mind because it really isn't about you at the end. It's definitely whatever they're internalizing and it just is projected onto us. And a lot of the negativity that we experience or that's projected onto us that's just like a mirror for kind of both of us right like yeah they've they've said it because it's a mirror for what they're going through um and then we're absorbing it because we needed to hear it and again like it does make us stronger in the end um and being an entrepreneur really is like so much self-discovery like I know myself so much deeper than I thought I ever would um, just from having my own business. Absolutely. And a fun question I love to ask people is besides the vendors that you work with, what are your favorite local businesses to support? Here in Middleborough. Oh, wow. I love hippie pilgrim soap. Mm, um, that's a good not, one. not soap. I'm sorry. It's the hippie pilgrim salt. Sorry. You're going to have to, you're going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> I love hippie pilgrim salt. Um, they have so many different flavors. So I put it all over my eggs. I put it on everything. Like every meal gets like some flavor of hippie pilgrim um, salt. Who else do I love? I love, um, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to look on here. I always support my friend Susie of the Sunflower Boutique um, because she is, she's one of my friends and it's super empowering because she was in the corporate world for years. And then like, Mm. you know, she decided to just do something that makes her happy and started her own boutique with clothing and it's super fun and she's always had style. So I'm just really proud of her. So I love, love, love going into her place at the Kingston collection um, and seeing all the fabulous clothes she has. I always end up with something. Um, who else do I love? Who have you shopped around in Middleborough for with? Well, I mean, I would say restaurant Chard Oak is a favorite. Um, I yes. do love getting iced lattes from Coffee Milano. Um, I would say I tend to stick to more like the foodie type stuff. <laughs> so oh. those like restaurants and eateries are my favorite, but <laughs> I mean, there's so many cute little shops around town you can just support and pop into. Susie left Middleborough to expand her store to something larger because she needed Mm -hmm. the space. 
her clothing line was growing. But um, I also love the Tiny Forest Soap Company. Have you run into Sue? Her soaps are glorious. Um, And she makes them like so pretty. So you can get like custom soaps. Like I've bought soaps that have like sun and moon on them. (laughs) And they all smell so lovely. And she does soap workshops. So I've like made my own. Oh, that's fun. With her. I know it was so fun. Like I definitely pictured myself as a soap maker. I'm like, I could get into this. <laughs> I know then you'll find a- yourself coming home with too many soaps. <laughs> I know my house smelled glorious afterwards too. I'm like, this is so amazing. But I do have friends that just like have their own farms and they, they grow wildflowers. I have a friend, um, Jennifer Freitas, that has a little farm stand on Bond Street in Middleborough. And she like grows all these vegetables and wildflowers during Ooh. the summer. Um, so I've like bought wildflowers from her and like incorporated them in my sessions. Um, so yeah, I always bring a little piece of Middleborough to wherever I go now that I'm oh, here. That's fun. Um, but I do love chard oak. I think chard oak is my number one for, for Middleborough. Oh, you know what else I love? Have you tried, um, I don't want to get this wrong, but I love it there. It's that Thai restaurant. Oh, is it check-in? Yes yeah they're pretty good I really like them too they have like amazing um they're like their version of crab ragoons oh yes a must (laughs) yeah and obviously pad thai noodles but it's so cute in there I really I know I know it is a good one it is a good one well Rhea it's been such a pleasure having you as a guest today on right here in mass and I'd love if you could share with our listeners where they can find you online in case they'd like to connect with you further Sure. You can find me online. Um, I'm on Instagram at Rhea McKenzie Photography. Really long name. It's R-I-A-M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E Photography. <laughs> that is also my website name, www.riamckenziephotography.com. Or I'm in my Facebook group for women, and that is Rhea McKenzie Empowerment Group. Perfect. And I will link to all of those in the show notes in case our listeners missed it. They can connect with you from there. But Rhea, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Thanks for having me.